Hello again. The Practical Animal Channel is dedicated to the public understanding of the animal industry. It does this by exploring jobs working with animals and the skills needed to succeed in conservation beyond being a volunteer or apprentice. Every week I interview a guest who works with animals. I ask what motivates them. Today we go to South Africa to speak with a wildlife rehabilitator, Emma de Yaga. I began by asking her what species she works with. This is her story, as well as that of the animals she rehabilitates. I actually work with an array of different species, up to about 100 different species at the center, um, from little dwarf mongoose up to hippo and everything in between. Uh, and then we also work with some endangered species as well, like the Temix gram pangolin. Fantastic. Right, I'm going to try and pronounce this properly. I'm probably okay. going to miserably. You Don't worry. are the co owner and rehabilitation manager at the Omoya Kalula Wildlife Centre? Yeah, perfectly. Yes, In yes. So we <laughs> we started Omoya six years ago now. Um, there was definitely a need for a good rehabilitation centre that was actually getting animals back out into the wild and a different array of animals. Um, unfortunately, the increase in the illegal wildlife trade and the pet trade, um, snaring victims has increased immensely. So we really felt a need for, a, for another centre and for us to try and save these animals. And you work with pangolins, lesser bush babies, is it? Yes, so we work with lesser and thick tail bush babies. Um, so they're the two primates we work with. Hippos, caracals, servals, warthogs, mongoose, birds of prey, um, also other birds. Um, so, yeah, we do a real variety and basically any animal that's been hurt by humans, we help. I must say it sounds fantastic. Now, you don't have a South African accent. No. Well, how did your career begin to <laughs> develop to today? So I'm from the UK originally, um, and I came out here a few years back when I was 18 years old um, to volunteer. I, I was crazy about animals and I had um, really wanted to come to the South Africa and work with animals. And then I kind of didn't leave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I went home for a few years. I also worked with other species in Australia and Thailand. I was very lucky. Um, and then I decided that actually South Africa was the place that I wanted to settle and, and, and help the animals here. So that was not giving away my age, but that was about 16 years ago. Grand. Yeah. How much of a challenge was that plan to actually put into action and to move out there? It was very hard, actually, to move out here, especially where we are. We're in the sticks. We're in the middle of nowhere in the bush, um, which I love and I wouldn't have any other way. Um, but I am from just a breading just outside London. So it was a very big change for me. Um, it was also... As a foreigner coming in um, to work with wildlife and to basically tell people that they're wrong sometimes, um, that they can't keep these animals as pets, and uh, that that's been the biggest struggles that I've that I've come across. Um, but in our community, definitely uh, over the years, people have actually seen the work that we're doing and and uh, uh, working together with us now, which is really nice. It sounds fantastic. Can I come out there, please? You can. You can. <laughs> Emma.
Emma, uh, which are the rarest species that you work with? So the rarest is the Temex ground pangolin. Um, all, not all, but most of the pangolins that come into us are confiscated from the illegal wildlife trade. So they're being poached in this country, um, normally to be shipped over uh, to, for Asian medicine for the scales. We also do see a lot of electrocution victims as well. So unfortunately in South Africa, every property is surrounded by a fence and a lot of those properties have electric lines. And when the pangolin walks over this line, not just pangolins, a lot of species, it gets severely electrocuted. Um, but because the defense mechanism of a pangolin is to roll in a ball, it rolls tightly around that fence line and then gets repeatedly shocked. So as you can imagine, normally they're pretty bad, bad wounds we see. Um, so they're the main reasons we actually get the pangolins in. And normally they come in pretty horrific condition. Yeah, I can imagine that sounds horrendous, actually. I hadn't mm. realised that's, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, I've looked at the website, Emma, and um, it seems that there's quite a, a structure to what you do. It's... Um, with the wildlife that you deal with, it is uh, rescue, uh, rehabilitation and release, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what does the rescue involve? Uh, and I imagine it, it differs depending on the species, Emma? Very much does. So first of all, it normally starts with a phone call from a member of the public. Um, and first we have to identify, does this animal actually need rescuing? Uh, that's a that's a big thing, you know, we get little antelopes like dikers and um, the mums hide the babies in the bush. They've not been abandoned. They absolutely haven't. They're fine. The mum knows where they are. And people come across them and think, oh, They've been abandoned and I must pick it up and help. So first of all, just identifying if humans should uh, intervene or not is our biggest thing. Then if unfortunately we do have to intervene, uh, it can be capturing that animal. Like I say, we work with some big species as well, like hippos, um, <laughs> which is not so easy to, to, <laughs> to um, catch. Uh, we actually did one just recently that had a baby had fallen into a cement dam and couldn't get out and unfortunately the mum had left she had probably been in there for about 48 72 hours and the mum had given up and, and had left now a baby hippo is a baby but it's still weighing about 60 kg <laughs> so it's not so easy just to catch and um, so that's that's a, one of our biggest hurdles and then finding um the appropriate place so we do an array of animals, but reptiles wouldn't necessarily come to us as we're not set up for for some species. Mm -hmm. uh, so I take it that uh, uh, you'll have to ask a lot of questions over the phone in order to assess whether the call out is needed. Very much. And pictures. Uh, also, people don't know species sometimes they get very confused with the different species um and they might say one species so we prepare for that species in the sense of the box we take the you know the, the equipment that we're taking with us and we get there and it in fact is a different species altogether and everything is a baby <laughs> so everyone always says oh it's a baby and sometimes it can be two years old uh you know so pictures is, is our best best friend that we can then determine what we actually need because travel boxes and equipment is actually really vital on rescuing these animals. Mm -hmm. um, it would be great, Emma, if you could um, describe to me, probably quite difficult to do because each case, each species is different, each species, each, each situation is probably different, but what would be two extremes during the rescue process, please? So the, the one would be orphaned baby. Um, so mum has either been killed um, by a domestic pet or a person, and it's quite easy to, to catch a little baby and, and take it away. The, the second would be a wild animal, an adult wild animal that has been hurt but is still mobile, um, that is, of course, very wary and scared of humans. And in those cases, we have to make sure we're in a viable area to actually catch the animal so that we don't do more damage than good. Um, you know, if we're next to a road, for example, that we don't chase them into that road 
or just stress in general. Stress on these adult animals is a huge killer because they're scared of what's happening to them um, so that we contain the situation very quickly. I imagine that you have volunteers, don't you? Yes. Are they allowed to accompany you on some or all of these rescues? They're allowed to accompany on some. Uh, some of the animals we do work with are dangerous uh, and, and they can obviously hurt. So if we are unsure about what we are walking into, uh, if we don't have such a clear picture, then my team will come in first to assess the situation. Um, but if it's, it's quite regulated uh, pickups and rescues, then, yeah, the volunteers do come along. What would the rehabilitation involve, Emma? I imagine it varies depending on species. It really does vary on age that they come in, um, condition, of course, that they come in with. And if they are a troop-structured animal or a solitary animal. Solitary animals are always easier to, to rehabilitate because you only need one. Um, but with troop structured animals, you obviously have to build that troop up first, which isn't necessarily very easy to do. And you really have to be careful uh, and get the correct ratios, male to female, and have a very cohesive troop that will actually thrive in the wild. So really, really depends. Um, but they kind of go through different stages. Medical is first, so assessment and seeing what condition they're in, whether they can go straight into our kind of pre-release enclosures or if they need to go into um, clinic. And then quarantine as well for a lot of the species. Some animals that we get in, we obviously do not know if they're carrying any diseases or not. And we have to be very careful that, one, we're not spreading it to the other animals at the property um, and, of course, people uh, and that's things including rabies, uh, tuberculosis, those kind of things. So we do have to keep a close eye on that. But once the animal is in a healthy situation, they go into a pre-release enclosure. Now in this enclosure, they're very big, fenced off, but kind of in the bush, very big, very dense, and they can't see humans all the time. We do go in to assist feed them, and to clean, but that is it. There is no human contact at all. We do not want them to come to humans at all. We want them to be scared of us, and we want to be seeing natural instincts. Um, so if it's a caracal, let's say, we want them to be jumping up and trying to catch birds and, and seeing that they can actually do this in the wild before release. Hmm. What does service involve, Emma? So we do two sorts of release. Uh, one's a hard release and one's a soft release. A hard release is pretty simple. Again, it's for those wild animals that have been maybe caught in a snare or hit by a car, just need a little TLC and then back out. We don't need to teach them anything. Um, and then a soft release is a really long-winded process. So first of all, we have to find a site and a, and a safe site. Once we found a safe site, we have to find a place at that site that doesn't already have too many of that species in that area. We'd hate to overpopulate the area, and then in the end, they would just get pushed out. Once we have found that and there's a sufficient food and water, we then actually build an enclosure. We then take the animals over, we'll put them in that enclosure for a week or two weeks just so they can acclimatise to their surroundings, and then we open the door. We still supplement feed them, but we start lessening and we monitor them very, very closely to make sure that they're sustaining their weight and everything. So for some animals, you know, two weeks and they're like, see you later, I'm good. Um, for some, it takes a little bit longer. And we found we've been most successful when we go in their speed uh, in captivity You've had a plate of food most days. You've had shelter. You haven't had to deal with predators. And now all of a sudden, the world is hard and the world is, you know, ruthless. And you have to kind of take baby steps towards that to actually make sure that they can survive in the wild. So we also do use trackers on them as well some of the species, so that we can keep monitoring them for quite a while afterwards to make sure that they're doing what they're meant to do. 
if you have um big cats, Emma, um, and they have been some time in captivity because of their rehabilitation needs, um, is the setup such that they don't come into contact with you anyway, or do you sometimes get this situation where they become quite tame? And if so, does that cause a problem for release? Yes. Um, so as, we get a lot of caracals and a lot of servos that have been pets. Uh, it's, it's a big trade in South Africa to have these as pets. Um, so they're normally very tame when they come in. So you do have to really go through these rehab process of kind of almost weaning them off people um, and, and having a situation where they don't depend on a human. Normally when they start hitting sexual maturity, their instincts do kind of take in and, and they want to be a wild animal again. But that's, that's where the release is just so, so important. When you've got animals that still are a little bit habituated to people if you haven't got it completely out of them you need to make sure that in a property that they're not going to see a human that there is there's no residence there's no lodges there's nothing around for hectares and hectares and hectares and you'll find after about six months of completely them being in the wild all those instincts take over and um in fact you know you don't have a problem at all what would constitute a problem animal relocation, Emma? We actually get a lot of these. Um, so they're called DCA uh, cases, which is a damage causing animal. Um, we get it a lot with leopards and we get it a lot with hippos. Um, obviously, when it's the leopards, it's more people's livestock or game um, that they're predating on. And then with the hippos, it's normally either destroying crops or being a threat to humans in villages. Um, so these animals either get relocated or they get euthanized. Obviously, we're pro relocation um, but some of these animals are not so easy to to relocate so when it comes to hippos as such um, we have with with our department in our area they have agreed to give us a three month time period that we're allowed to relocate that animal and if we can't do it in that free time three month time period then um, then unfortunately the, the other has to happen but we have been very successful at relocating hippos and actually we had a huge drought in South Africa for several years so Populations of hippos in some places declined dramatically, whereas actually in our area it increased dramatically. So we have too many hippos this side, but there are viable release sites. Leopards is a little bit harder, um, if I'm honest with you. There are leopards most places, and it's very hard to find a safe place to release a leopard where there's not another leopard's territory in. Um, it is still doable. And if you, you know, you make sure you have the right contacts and people that know the, the places, but also catching a leopard, you have to have the right equipment, uh, the right trapping cages because they hurt themselves um, hugely in just normal wire trapping cages. So we have seen cases where people have tried to relocate them. Um, but unfortunately, they not use the right equipment. And then in the end, they actually break their teeth. Um, they break, rip their claws off. And you can't release a carnival without their teeth. Right. Yeah. Oh, sure. God. It sounds absolutely fascinating and extremely challenging. Yes, it's very challenging. It's very, very challenging. And it's the biggest challenge for me is trying to get people to realize we have to live together <laughs> um you know we really have taken over most of their their work one um and we really need a situation together i get a phone call once a week about a hippo that maybe is walking in the village it's not hurt anybody it's just come out of the river it's, it's really not doing anything but people want to shoot it immediately they want it away um, because of the fear 
And I'm not saying we should wait till it does hurt somebody, but we need to have this happy balance of how do we live together? Because if it carries on like this, we're just going to wipe out all the animals. Uh, it sounds as though you've got lots of very sophisticated protocols in place, Anna. Um, is that something that you and the team came up with or did you have to go to the wildlife management textbooks or, or what? So I think it's a bit of both, really. Um, you know, I think a lot of rehabbers will say it's trial and error, to be honest, sometimes. Um, and what will work for one animal, even of the same species, might not work for the next, um, depending on their situation. There is obviously standards that we have to adhere to um, in the country, which of course we do. And just gaining knowledge of other places. I think being really open and sharing knowledge is really, really important. Um, sometimes we get a species in which we just don't know much about and finding out everything that we can. And if we are not the best place for that particular animal, finding the place that is. Mm -hmm. um, Emma, when you inspect a, a release site, uh, mm -hmm. what do you look for in order to approve it? So depending on what species I'm going for. Um, so first will be the size of the property. Um, really, we're not looking at anything under 5,000 hectares um, or below that, because like I said, I need that space for those animals to, to wild up. Hardly any humans is always a winner. Um, fencing. As I said before, electric fences cause huge problems with animals, so I'm not a fan of electric fence. Um, the top is not too bad, but this bottom trip line of electric fence. And then obviously it needs to have food, it needs to have water. And depending on the animal, if this is a hand raised animal, so it's been in captivity from, from you know, a day old, the predatorial awareness is not as good as you can imagine. So I wouldn't want to release those animals into a high populated predator area. Um, it kind of is just setting them up to fail. So it really, really differs uh, from the species and, and the individuals. Do the volunteers come for three months from all over the world? Do they have a meet and greet at the airport? How does the volunteer program work? So we do take in international volunteers. Our max numbers is up to 12. Um, and they come from all over the country, UK, America, you know, a lot from the um, Europe, uh, Australia, everywhere. So there is a volunteer program that they, they come to. Two weeks is our minimum. I prefer if people can stay uh, for about eight weeks um, to three months, just because I think you really start understanding things a little better and you, you see the animals go through that process. Um, so I think it gives you more of an idea. And then they fly into our local town, which is Hoodsbrake, where we collect them. And then, um, yeah, I have myself and I have a team here that that organise trips. Um, we do a lot of education with the volunteers and then we teach them how to care for these different species, um, whether it be babies or nutritional or medical. And the importance of why wild animals should be wild. As for yourself, uh, a Brit living over there in wildlife rehabilitation, uh, what about your influences? Uh, what books or people or meetings have most influenced you as a conservationist out in South Africa? Gosh, that is a question. Um, I think any everyone and anyone that helps a wild animal, well, any animal, to be quite honest, and gives their life for them, I admire hands down. Um, how would you describe your connection, Emma, with wild animals? Is it a, a compassionate um, connection or is it a, a dispassionate scientific fascination? A bit of both. I um, I definitely am very compassionate for them. Um, you know, when you get to know a species and you get to know the behaviour of a species, you can definitely read that animal very well um, and, and predict what's going to happen next once you know that species. When an animal comes in, 
you know, some people get excited. This is not the good bit for me. Even when an animal is released, I'm still not excited. Six months down the line, when I see that animal and it doesn't want to have anything to do with me, that's when you'll see me smiling. So <laughs> it's very... I don't need the love back from them. I actually want them to say, no, leave me alone. Um, it's when I've seen that I've done my job properly and those animals are thriving, they're being wild animals and they don't want anything to do with humans. That's when I'm happy. That's when I'm really, really happy. Somebody watching this, Emma, who thinks I love all animals and I just want to throw a huge, massive embrace around them. Listening to you say that and you're at your happiest when you know you've done your job, which is six months down the line when the animal doesn't want to know you. Yeah. Somebody feels like saying, how can you say that? <laughs> I promise you the feeling of seeing them in the wild and not in captivity is hands down a million times better. It really, really is. For people who come and help and they haven't had much experience with wildlife, they haven't had much experience of uh, the terrible cruelties that you see and the tragedies that result. How do you counsel them to, to you know, develop a thick skin? We have a really open policy here. So we talk very openly, um, you know, about things like euthanasia, which is, is, is not a nice topic, um, but it's, a, it's reality in the job that we do. If you cry, that's fine. It just means... It affected you and it should affect you. It's a sad thing. You know, for me, the minute it doesn't affect you, then you probably shouldn't be doing the job. Um, my one rule I have to say is, though, if you are present um, with an animal and, you know, we're euthanizing, you can't cry until after just because I do believe our feelings and emotions, um, you know, go through the animal and they can feel us sad and that will then make them sad. But How would you describe um, the situation with wildlife rehabilitation today in South Africa, Emma? Is there a whole network of rehabilitation centres around? Some are species specific uh, and then some do an array of animals. Volunteer tourism has become a huge industry. People have to be very wary of the places that they pick. Uh, there are some fantastic rehabilitation centres, um, but there's also ones that are profiting. We have groups on our phones that if anyone has an injured animal and they can't get to it, who's the closest? Uh, if we have troop-structured animals or someone's building a troop, we make sure we pull them all together so we can get those animals out quicker. Emma, do you have any advice for somebody uh, from the UK or anywhere else wanting to come to South Africa to work in wildlife conservation? How can they choose a good project? First of all, I think it's um, very important to go online and see any reviews of the place and get in contact with the owners if you can and really ask important questions. If, if people are quite hesitant to answer those questions and not let you behind the secret doors, then there's probably a reason. So know your species, know what you want to work with, and then decide if you also want to do rehabilitation or sanctuary, because they're two very, very different things. And um, rehabilitation, you do need to know that these animals are going back out into the wild. And if you can't do that, then unfortunately, there's, there's no other solution for them. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Emma? This is the most amazing job in the world. It is the hardest job in the world. Um, I definitely think rehabilitation over the last few years has been glamorized quite a lot. Um, and I get to do some amazing things, so please don't get me wrong, but I'm also covered in poo and scratched and bitten every single day of my life. <laughs> I am up at four o'clock in the morning and sometimes don't go to bed till two o'clock in the morning. So it is a very, very hard job. So you have to be very passionate about it. But like I say, the reward, I promise you, is the best thing ever. Emma Diaga, co-owner and rehabilitation manager at Umoya Kulula Wildlife Centre in South Africa. Thank you so much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you for having me.